Hello everyone, my name is Ana Eastotis Georgiou and I'm a developer advocate at Influx Data. So today's talk, we're gonna be talking about how you can become a Flux Pro. Specifically, we're gonna learn about some of the biggest hurdles that beginner Flux users face and then also we're gonna move on to additional resources that can help you really become a Flux Pro and take advantage of Flux. So diving into the agenda in a little bit more detail, after we talk about some of the initial hurdles that a lot of Flux users face when they're first starting to learn Flux, then we'll move on to understanding some critical functions that can help you not only debug Flux, but also take advantage of its capabilities. Then we're gonna take some time to talk about some of the existing tools that can help you learn Flux a lot faster. And finally, I'll talk about some additional learning resources so that if you're someone who thrives from a structured learning environment, then you can be aware of these resources and take advantage of them, specifically if you're trying to learn Flux. So one of the first things that users are faced with when they write data to InfluxDB is that they use Flux to query data out and they see this result stream. And in this result stream, there is a series of tables or a stream of tables. And one of the first questions that beginner Flux users ask is, what is this stream of tables? Why am I having you know, three tables for this one query and four tables for this other query? How do I build an intuitive feel of the results that I'm gonna get back from Flux and this table structure? And in order to understand this and answer these questions, beginner Flux users need to understand the very first concept, which is that the input format in, in FluxDB does not equal the output format. So the input format is line protocol, and hopefully you're familiar with that already. It's the first line that you see on this slide. And the output format is called annotated CSV. And part of annotated CSV, part of that data contains what is known as a group key. And these group keys define the table output and the table structure. So we'll talk more detail about group keys in a second, but I just wanted to give an example of how line protocol by default gets transformed to tables on disk. So if we are writing these two uh, medicine text lines of line protocol, we have a measurement one, and then we have three fields, field one, field two, field three. And remember, a series is a unique combination of measurement, tag sets, and field keys. So since we have no tags, we only have one measurement here, and we have three fields we have a total of three series. So by default, these three series get converted to three tables on disk. So when you simply query for all the data from this one measurement, assuming there's no other fields in this measurement, you are going to return three tables. And like I said, those tables are identified and determined by their group keys. So what does that mean? Well, Flux operates on stream of tables. Hopefully we understand that now. And every table has a group key. And what is a group key? A group key is a list of columns for which every record in that column is identical. And you can use Flux to combine those columns or those tables. You can use Flux to divide the tables, join the tables. And by changing these group keys, you can change the number of tables that are in the result stream with Flux. So following that example we just looked at, if we look at the three tables that we've produced here, we have four columns, underscore measurement, underscore field, underscore value, and underscore time. And underscore measurement and underscore field, we notice that for each table, each record in that table, they have the same values. So that's why these two columns are part of the group key. Whereas the underscore value and the underscore time columns, they have different values. So those are not part of the group key. So to better highlight and understand grouping, which I think is really like the biggest hurdle that beginner Flux users face, I wanted to take an example from an actual data set and do some manipulation with Flux to answer some questions that we might want to understand or derive from this data. So we'll be looking at a data set from the um, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and this data set describes water levels in two creeks from Santa Monica and Coyote Creek. And specifically, we'll be looking at the average temperature measurement, and we're looking at one field in that measurement, which is degrees, and one tag, which is location, which has two values for Santa Monica and Coyote Creek. So for that one measurement, the average temperature measurement, will have um, two series being written. And the question we want to answer today is how do I calculate the mean across Coyote Creek and Santa Monica? Because as we know, the way that Flux operates is that you're constantly pipe forwarding the output 
of one function into another function. And that happens on a per table basis. So for example, if I just query all my data from the average temperature measurement, and then I simply then pipe forward that data, which has one result with two tables in it, one for Coyote Creek and one for Santa Monica. And then I were to apply a mean function, I'm saying apply that mean function to every table in that result stream. But if I want the mean temperature across both of those tags, I need to do some grouping. I need to reshape my data. So the way that I'm gonna answer that question is first query for my data like I normally would. Um, I use the from bucket to specify the bucket that I'm querying that data from. Then I'm gonna also specify my range, filter for that measurement and those tags, as well as the field that I want to query for. And then I'm going to limit the result of my flux function to the first three records from the table. And I'll talk more about how much I love the limit and the yield function in just a second, but I always use these two functions to not only debug my flux script, but also to reduce the output in my flux script so that I can visualize all of the results and all of the tables in my result in one page um, for each transformation that I'm applying to flux or each time that I use a field function so that I can have an understanding of how flux is operating on my data. And then next, I'm gonna group on the measurement column. Since we're querying from only one measurement, if I group on the measurement, any tables that are in that result stream will now be grouped together. So let's take a second to look at the first yield, the yield before I'm actually grouping, and I've named that result before. And then also let's take a look at the result after I've grouped our data, and that's called group on measurement. So here's what our data looks like before. There are two tables in this result stream that we've labeled before with the yield function. And then once we group on measurement, we get this new result stream called group on measurement. And we can see now that we have one table in our result stream. And previously, by default, because the series are defined by the tags, the field keys, and the measurement, you can see that the measurement, field, location, and start and stop, which are added. There are also additional parts of your flux query which are added from the range function. Those are all part of the group key because they're the same value in every record for those columns. Whereas underscore value and underscore time columns, those are not part of the group key, just like we saw before. And then once we apply that group, we're saying only group on the measurement column. So now that will be the only thing that's part of the group key and all the other columns are no longer part of the group key. And now that we have all of our results in one table, now if we pipe forward that table into another function, like the mean function, we can actually get our result. So the last thing we have to tack on are these two final lines. We, we add the mean function, and then we're also gonna name that result mean just so we can distinguish all the different yield functions. And here's our final result. It's also worth noting that not all functions in Flux uh, preserve columns that are not part of the group key. And bare aggregators like the mean function are is one of these examples of one of the functions that does this. So that's just something to keep in mind that some functions operate that way. If you were using a bare selector like min, max, last, that's literally just you know, picking that one value. So it'll pick the entire row and preserve all those columns for you. And so this is just another consideration that you have to think about when you're a beginner flux user is what columns do I want to preserve and what columns do I need to group by? And this whole thought process is something that you'll gain an intuitive feel for. And before you know it, you'll be able to kind of have a mental image in your head of what the group keys look like and how joining or grouping or pivoting your data might change those group keys and what the shape of that data will look like. Another huge part of learning any language is embracing experimentation. You're not gonna learn a new language if you're not willing to just try something, answer questions that you have for yourself and fail. But there are certain tools that allow you to fail more gracefully. And when you have a good experience failing and you can have fun failing, then you're more likely to learn the material easily and faster. So there are some tools that InfluxDB makes that can help you learn Flux more easily. Um, and the first one I'll talk about is the InfluxDB UI. And I'll go about explaining the features that I love about the InfluxDB UI that help me learn Flux and write Flux. And then I'll also talk about the VS Code Editor and how I think that's a great resource if you're already really comfortable with Flux and you are Flux Pro and you want to take your Flux to the next level. Because also, I just want to mention here, I see a lot of new users using Grafana to learn Flux. And Grafana is a fantastic tool, but it wasn't purpose-built to help users learn Flux. So if you 
are trying to learn Flux or you're trying to understand if this is something that you do want to learn, I really recommend that you go and get yourself signed up for a free cloud trial and then mess around with the Influx DB UI and use that tool to help you learn Flux. And that will just give you an intuitive feel for whether or not this is something that you are interested in pursuing more. And I recommend trying that out first before you use other tools, just because I think that's the, the better place to start. So let's talk about why I like the Influx DB UI when it comes to learning Flux. Well, the first thing that I love about it is the inject function capabilities. And so that's on the very right hand side, highlighted in pink there next to the submit button. Basically you can search for any function that Flux offers and inject the function directly. So this means that you don't have to learn any sort of Flux syntax. And there's also in-app documentation that can help you understand all the parameters of the function and what you can do with it. Additionally, I also recommend that you go to the docs pages themselves and take a look at a lot of the Flux function examples because there are not only examples with input and output that help you understand how Flux will transform your data, but oftentimes there's scripts that include sample data sets um, that will be written or used with Flux. So you don't even have to worry about having data in InfluxDB. You can simply copy and paste those examples and see how Flux will transform your data for yourself. The other thing that I love about the InfluxDB UI as well is that you can include multiple tabs for your queries. So right now in this example, I only have one query and that's kind of above the aggregate window or that Flux script, that blue line. I have only one tab here, but you can have multiple tabs and silence different tabs. And in this way, you can kind of compare and contrast how like changing small things in a Flux query might yield different results. So I also really like that capability as well. And then finally, I love to live in the raw data view. So anytime you're looking at any visualization, whether or not that's a table, line, stat, whatever you're looking at, you can navigate over to the raw data view. And what I love about this view is that it allows you to see all of the results from your Flux query, all of the table streams, all in one view that isn't paginated. So you can really have an understanding for the shape of your data in a better and clearer way. And just to highlight what I mean by that, imagine for example, that I want to explore some different transformations on my data. The first thing I would want to do is take my data, query for it, and store it in a variable. This is another tip that uh, beginner Flux users might not be, a be aware of. You can store your base query in a variable and then reference that variable so that you're not constantly querying for all of your data again, which will impact the performance of your Flux script positively. And so in this example, what I do is I query for my data, then I limit my results to just one so that I can visualize all of my Flux transformations on the same page in my data explorer. Then I, again, I use the yield function to name that result. I reference that raw data variable in another variable. I add some more transformations like a group and a pivot, and I name those results as well so that when I go to the raw data explorer, I can see all of those results together and I can see how those functions have transformed not only the group keys, but also the shape and the pivot. And so in this way, like I have a, a very intuitive understanding of how Flux is operating on my data. But yield isn't just for being used as a print statement, which is kind of how I've been talking about it so far. The yield function is also in its purest form just meant to help you display and return multiple results from your data. So for example, if I want to calculate the min, max, and mean of values across um, my data set, then I can first query for all my data, store that in a variable, reference that variable, and then apply all these different functions. So the second big concept that Flux users start to develop or start to understand is kind of this branching structure, right? You're gonna have your base query, and then you're gonna reference that, and then you're gonna maybe branch off to this side, apply logic to some of that data, and then apply different logic to the other side, and then maybe you join them back together, maybe you don't. Um, but if you need to visualize or return intermediate results, you do that with the yield function. And now if you are an advanced Flux user, I really recommend that you take advantage of the Flux VS Code extension. That's because with the Flux VS Code extension, you can save your scripts, you get all of the functionality and capabilities of the code editor itself, which if you're writing really long scripts, obviously you really want. And the other thing that I really appreciate about it is the ability to go back and forth between different orgs. So in this example, I am connected to two InfluxDB instances. 
um, one under the Ana East org and one under the John org. And what I love about this approach is that you could make one org maybe a free cloud tier account and put some dummy data in there and not mess with your original data and use that as kind of as an experimentation environment. Try things out there. And then once you have something that's working in a simplified environment, then you could port over the same code by just changing maybe some names of your code to your actual environment. And so that's another like utility that I really appreciate about the VS Code extension. But you can also manage your InfluxDB instance with it as well. And if you're someone who's building an application on top of InfluxDB, it makes sense that you don't want to be switching back and forth between the InfluxDB UI and uh, Visual Studio. So I also want to take a moment to talk about some resources that can help you learn Flux. If you've been to any of the other sessions today, you might be really familiar with a lot of these. So I don't want to go into detail about all of them. I just want to focus on the ones I think will help you learn Flux the best. And the first one I want to talk about is the InfluxDB University courses. These are free courses um, that have been developed by a ton of people in the company, but they were all really built off of community questions and community feedback. And there are a ton of different courses that you can take, um, courses on InfluxDB, on Telegraph, and obviously Flux. And there's beginner Flux courses, advanced Flux courses, uh, intermediate Flux courses. So if you're someone that craves structure for learning, I highly recommend that you check this out. You also get a badge that where you get to you know, share your credentials um, with everyone on LinkedIn, which is fun too. I also want to mention the Time to Awesome book. This was a book that was written by myself and Rick Spencer. And in this book, um, it was particularly written to target developers that are looking to build applications on top of InfluxDB. And part two is really all about understanding um, the data model, the input and output formats, and how Flux fits into them. The reason why I really enjoy part two for learning Flux is because there's a cohesive example throughout the entire book. So it really helps you, or it helps me build my knowledge and understanding when I'm working off one example the entire time. Um, so I recommend checking that out. Also, there's information about optimizing Flux performance as well. And so if uh, a book is like how you like to learn, I recommend checking it out. And recently, the developer advocate team has also added a section to the docs called how-to guides. These how-to guides right now have, are just Flux specific. They might include how-to guides on other things. But right now, they really focus on unique, creative, and interesting ways that you can use Flux to do even more. And so here's a screenshot of some of the things that you can do. The one how-to guide that I really want to focus on is the late arriving data guide. Nathaniel Cook, our Flux wizard, wrote the actual Flux script behind this guide, and the developer advocate team wrote the how-to guide. And what this Flux solution handles and helps you with is this following scenario. So imagine you're a user, and you're collecting data from different sources, and you need to downsample that data. But you rely on a accurate downsampling of that data. So let's say we're calculating the mean every hour. And that mean value, it's critical that that value be correct. But you have data, data latency problems. So you have data that's arriving late. And so the mean value that you're collecting every hour doesn't actually reflect the true value once that late data arrives. So how can we handle this situation with Flux? Well, what this guide walks you through is creating a task that invokes an invocable script with the API. And that invocable script does two things. It, one, calculates the mean value from your raw data. And it, two, also looks at how many points were used to calculate that mean value. Then from there, we have another script or another task that compares the count that was used to calculate that aggregated value across the new data or the late arriving data that we are getting into our raw data bucket. And so if the old count doesn't match the new count, then we go back and we update that aggregated value for that time to account for the late arriving data and the data latency. And so in this way, we're kind of using Flux almost to conditionally trigger Flux tasks. And so this is like an extension of Flux that I think is really cool and that um, this tutorial walks you through how to use it. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you in the next sessions.